This town never used to bring me down. I used to love to drive around, always on my way to you. It's changed. The city doesn't seem the same. Never thought I could feel so strange. Music has been a huge part of my life, and the Seattle scene in particular of the early 90s was very important to me. And it's kind of a shame that it's gone away, and there was a lot of all ages um, venues open at that time, and a lot of kids, any age, could enjoy any show. Avoiding certain streets. A lot of places closed down. Um, let's see, about November, Rock Candy did, Velvet Elvis closed down last June. And those were big all ages places that a lot of kids went to. There's a lot of stuff that we were restricted, like curfews and whatnot. And uh, concerts just let us go out and have a nice place where we can hang out and not get in any trouble. I was so like upset when Rock Candy closed down, I just like to say, because I really didn't know where to turn after that. That was like the only all ages club in the city. Upside down. Scenes like this are beginning to make people think that something new is afoot in Seattle. Mixed aged audiences listening to music in an alcohol free environment. But not too long ago, things were very different. The city's once thriving young adult music scene nearly collapsed. Many blame Seattle's teen dance ordinance for its decline. The ordinance was passed more than a decade ago in response to a situation that had gotten out of hand. Here at the corner of Stewart and Boren, a church-owned dance hall called the Monastery courted a mixed-age crowd. It was well known for harboring illegal activities. The selling of drugs, underage drinking and child prostitution. The community was upset. Parents were outraged. And in 1985, the police finally shut it down. The teen dance ordinance made it illegal for clubs catering to adults to allow dancing for minors. But it failed to clearly define what a dance was and provided no distinction between a dance and a concert. The ordinance did require places operating public dances to be licensed. Ironically, a church-operated venue like the monastery would have been exempt. At first, enforcement was sporadic. But eventually, clubs offering all-ages concerts were routinely harassed or shut down, casting a pall over the once vibrant young adult music scene. The teen dance ordinance has really had a chilling effect upon the all-ages music scene in Seattle because, well, for many reasons. One, the document's very, very difficult to understand. The original teen dance ordinance is just a nine-page document full of legal ease. And so it is very difficult for promoters to understand what is expected of them to abide by the law. The security requirements in the teen dance ordinance have been very cost prohibitive. They require a high degree of police officers, off-duty police officers hired by the promoter to work at all ages shows. And promoters simply can't afford to do that when they're doing five and six dollar doors for a couple hundred kids. So that has been a big issue. The insurance requirements in the teen dance ordinance, a million dollar policy for all promoters have been cost prohibitive. So those are three of the primary things. And then the major thing is the age restrictions. As a band member specifically, um, it's almost impossible to get all ages shows in the city. Your options are either play a mixed use show, which means playing an early show at a, a bar um, and immersing yourself in an alcohol environment, um, or hoping that by some grace there will be an all ages show for you to play on. In the late 1990s, things began to loosen up. Relaxing of state liquor laws allowed clubs to cater to both those under and over age 21 offering an earlier alcohol-free concert for people of all ages, followed by a later one for the drinking over 21 crowd. 
also in the picture were a more sympathetic mayor and new city council members. People committed to improving the situation for everyone. In February of 1999, they created a music and youth task force to help them figure out a lot what of to task do. Task force members don't particularly want to have a dance ordinance, but if we're going to have one, this is what we recommend. Our intent was to bring all the major parties to a single place, a round table, literally, to meet for over a year, as it turns out, to discuss how we can address the, the issue of the teen, dan teen dance ordinance and also make, essentially, more venues available to youth. We've had amazing numbers of people come to the task force, sit in the audience at the council chambers, kind of watching the task force as it operates. And if you know how dull most council processes and task force processes and things like that can be to sit in the audience and think about teenagers, you'll know that this reflects a real serious commitment and a real concern. Meeting regularly, the task force became a forum for opening up communication among all the parties, slowly creating some mutual understanding out of anger and distrust. When we first started out, we had very passionate meetings, um, which I, I welcome, the passion there. Um, but people weren't necessarily hearing each other. And as time went on, we saw more communication happening between promoters and the police and people who were running clubs and our city officials. Um, and I, I believe a certain level of trust that everyone really is there for the same reasons, having the same values. My knowledge has been increased significantly. Um, I, part of being a police officer is going out there and meeting people and meeting your community and getting to know who they, they, they are. And that's one area of the, of the community that I didn't really know. So I, I think I've benefited greatly. I can come to the table and speak in the vernacular of a band member current in Seattle, but the captain of the police department is going to come and speak a completely different language when talking about the same issue. So now that we've all come to terms, quite literally, I feel as though I have a number of different avenues that I can take. All of us that have worked on the Teen Dance Ordinance for a long time came in here with, with what we thought was how it should be. And we thought this is totally fair and everyone should be happy with this. And we realized really quickly that we didn't know a lot about, about how laws work, about how the cities run, about what police need, about what fire needs. Um, and so we've learned pretty quickly. Um, the harsh, brutal reality of, of the political process. It's been amazing the commitment of the people, both from the city and the people who volunteered and were appointed to be on the Music and Youth Task Force. There have been about a dozen people who have committed so much time and energy to this effort. What I have learned is that it takes a long, long time to change a city ordinance. More than a year after its first meeting, the task force came up with a number of recommendations. Among them, establishing city-owned music venues, repealing the teen dance ordinance, and replacing it with an all-ages dance ordinance, and creating a music and youth commission, whose job in part would be to monitor the new regulations and provide a forum for working through difficult issues. Seattle's current, more youth-friendly environment appears to be having an impact perhaps suggesting a revival of Seattle's teen and young adult music scene. Is it dead or alive? Only time will tell. It's a really good time right now, actually. Like, everyone's thinking that there's no shows around town, but there's actually more shows now, I think, than there has been in the last couple of years, because there's so many places that are over 21 willing to let kids come in and see the bands. Take me.